In this video, we're going to do incidents, accidents and emergencies as part of the Study With Me series. Hi, I'm Dorian from Think to Success. In this video, I'm doing the category of incidents, accidents and emergencies as part of the Study With Me series, where I'm covering all 14 categories, where I'm doing a 20 question mock test, where I break it down, give you hints, tips and tricks to help you best pass your theory test first time. So let's jump onto my desktop and get started. So the first question, you arrive at the scene of a motorcycle crash. If a rider is injured, when should the helmet be removed? Now, the helmet is designed to protect the skull, so the only time it needs to be removed is if you're gonna give some first of first aid. We're looking for something along those lines. Only when it's essential. If it's essential, then that's when it's gonna be removed. So let's take that one for now. And as I always say, read all the answers just in case there's a better one. Always straight away, never, because it's protect the skull, so leave it on if it's not necessary. Only when the motorcyclist arcs, again, no. Always, unless they're in shock, no. So only when it's essential. So basically when you're gonna give some first or first aid, that's when you're gonna remove it. You are the first person to arrive at an incident where people are badly injured. You switched on your hazard warning lights and checked all engines are stopped. What else should you do? Okay, let's see what options they give us. Make sure that an ambulance has been, yeah, straight away, make sure an ambulance is called. If you turn up at a scene of an accident where people's already helping out and no ambulance is visible, do not be afraid to phone for an ambulance. The ambulance service don't mind how much time a call is placed because they're getting live updates from that. So if there's no ambulance visible, make sure you call one. So that seems the best answer. But again, read all the answers just to make sure it is the best one out of the lot. Stop other cars and ask drivers for help. No, move people who are injured clear of their vehicle. No, never remove anyone from their vehicle unless it's absolutely necessary because you can cause more harm than good. If they're safe enough, leave them there. Try and get people who are injured to drink something. Never give someone food or drink at an accident. So it's gonna be that one is the best option. What should you do if a tire bursts while you're driving? That's what we know. That's what we call a blowout. So let's see what they give us. Pull up slowly at the side of the road. That's a possible. Pull on the parking brake. Never pull on the parking brake while a car is in motion anyway, especially with the blowout. That ain't gonna help. Parking brake, for those of you who don't know, is called handbrake. One's American term, one's English. Because sometimes when they use the term parking, students struggle to understand what they're talking about. But parking brake and handbrake is the same thing. Brake as quickly as possible. Don't brake because you're down to three wheels. So if you brake, the car will shift left or right, depending which tire has gone. And continue on at normal speed. You won't be able to continue because you're down to three wheels. That's the safest one out of all of them. An adult casualty isn't breathing. To maintain circulation, CPR should be given. What's the correct depth to press down on their chest? With this, they're talking about chest compressions. So with this, they're talking about chest compressions where you clasp your fingers together and you're gonna use the base of your palm to go into the middle of their chest. For an adult, you're looking at five to six centimeters. For a child, it's three to four centimeters because their chest plate is not strong as an adult. So that's the answer you're looking for, about five to six centimeters for an adult. So let's see what they've given us. One to two centimeters, no. Five to six centimeters for an adult, yes. 15 to 20 centimeters, no, that's way, way too deep. And 10 to 15 centimeters is way too deep. Which document may the police ask you to produce after you've been involved in a collision? If you've been involved in a collision, the police are gonna ask you for your driver's license. They need to know that you're legal. Obviously, if you've had an accident, with when you're learning to drive with a supervisor, either a driving instructor or mum, dad, family member, they're looking for that provisional license. So your vehicle service record, no. Your ferry test certificate, no. Your vehicle registration document, no. Your driver's license is gonna be that one. There's been a collision. How can you help a driver who's suffering from shock? Offer them a cigarette. Ask who caused accident, that's pointless. Give them a drink. You should never give someone a drink at the scene of an accident and reassure them confidently. 
reassure them is going to be that one. And what reassure them mean is stay with them, keep talking to them, talk to them about anything and everything under the sun, but don't tell them they're going to be fine. Don't tell them they're going to be okay. You can't give people false hope. Doctors and nurses don't even say to you, you're going to be fine. You're going to be okay. They shouldn't anyway, if they do, but they shouldn't do that. So you can't give people false hope, but reassuring them is just staying with them, give them comfort, let them know someone's there for them, and then talk to them about anything and everything under the sun. Which sign shows that a tank is carrying dangerous goods? So remember, always look at the image. You have to look at the image to get the answer on this one, but yeah, always look at the image first and then go from there. Long vehicle, all that does is tell you the vehicle's long, so that's normally in the back of a lorry. You've got explosive there, so obviously things that can explode is going to be dangerous. So it's going to be B. That's not that one, and that's a warning of some type of hazard. So it's B. You arrive at an incident. There's no danger from fire or further collisions and on the emergency services and the emergency services have been called. What's your first priority when attending to an unconscious motorcycle? Let's read that again because it's kind of long. You arrive at an incident, so you've arrived. There's no danger from fire or further collisions and the emergency services have been called. What's your first priority? Make sure they're breathing. Check the airways, that's something along those lines is what you're looking for. Check whether they're bleeding, it's possible. Check whether they have broken bones, no, because you're not going to know that. Check whether they're breathing normally, that's going to be more important. There's no point checking for bleeding if they're not breathing. And check whether they have any bruising. So that's going to be the most important one, make sure they're still breathing. Following a collision, a person has been injured. What would be a warning sign for shock? Rapid, shallow breathing, that's all. Flushed complexion, no. Slow pulse, no. And warm, dry skin. It's going to be rapid, shallow breathing. What should you do to reduce the risk of your vehicle catching fire? Use fuel additives, no. Keep water levels above maximum, no. Check out any strong smell of fuel. It's going to be that one. It's similar to at home, if you use gas, you check it out. So if you smell fuel, petrol, diesel in your car, check it out. Avoid driving with a full tank of fuel, no. At an incident, a casualty is unconscious but breathing. When should you move them? You're only going to move someone if they're in further danger. If they're in the middle of the road, for example, and the traffic has been stopped, leave them in the middle of the road. Moving them unnecessarily can cause them more harm than good. No internal injuries that you cannot see. So only move someone if they're in further danger. When there's a risk of further danger, yeah. When, by, when bystanders offer to help you, no. When an ambulance is on its way, no. When bystanders tell you to move them, no. There's going to be that one. Like I said, move someone who's in further danger. At an incident, how can you help a casualty who has stopped breathing? Normally with this one, you're looking for the DR ABC code. The way that I normally explain it, the easier way to remember it is doctor because it's first aid and then your alphabet, which is ABC. D stands for danger. Assess the risk and the danger to you. So before diving in helping people, assess that you're going to be safe in doing that. It's no point risking your life to help somebody else in that sense. R is to get a response from the person. So once you get a response from the person, then you know what to try and do. And A is check their airways. B is then check their breathing by listening. If it comes up in the ferry test at a later time stage at least for 10 seconds and then c is checking for a cut circulation which is obviously checking for a pulse that's what it stands for d r a b c that's what we're looking for follow the d r a b c code exactly what we just spoke about keep the head tilted forward as far as possible you're never going to tilt someone's head as far as possible if they stop breathing and um, raise their legs to help with circulation no and try to give them something to drink again you never give anyone something to drink at a scene of an accident what should you do first if your vehicle has broken down on an automatic railway level crossing? Safest option, get everybody out. Don't attempt to start it, don't attempt to push it. Get everybody out of the car. Walk along the track to give warning to any approaching trains, no. Get everyone out of the vehicle and clear of the crossing, yes. Try to push the vehicle clear of the crossing as soon as possible, no. Telephone your vehicle recovery service to move it, no. 
you've broken down on a two-way road you have a warning triangle at least how far from your vehicle should you place your warning triangle your warning triangle should be placed 45 meters away from a broken down car but never on the motorway so if the question comes up asking about motorways it's never on a motorway because you can't you shouldn't be placing triangles on the motorway because you're not allowed on the main carriageway and obviously if you break down on the motorway you can uh, get to the hard shoulder so with this question you're looking at 45 minutes 45 meters away from your car i'm not going to edit that out i'm going to leave that in five meters no 25 meters no 100 meters no 45 meters yes what should you do if you have to stop while you're going through a congested tunnel what should you do if you have to stop while you're going through a congested tunnel. That's the interesting one. Okay, congested, again, breaking it down, keeping it simple, just means busy, traffic, that type of thing. Make a U-turn to find another route, no. Ignore any messages, just read that again, dyslexia kicking in. Ignore any message signs as they never up to date, no. Pull up very close to the vehicle in front to save space, no. Should always leave tires and tarmac, so it's never gonna be safe. Keep a safe distance from the vehicle in front. Again, keyword there, safe. What's the fairy test about? safety so it's going to be that one you arrive at a scene of a crash where someone is bleeding heavily from a wound in their arm nothing is embedded in the wound what could you do to help tie something around it squeeze very tight so let's stab the wound no give them a drink again never give anyone a drink at the scene of an accident walk them around and walk them around and keep them talking no apply pressure over the wound you want to apply heavy pressure over that wound it extends the blood flow a collision has just happened. An injured person is lying in a busy road. What's the first thing you should do? Warn other traffic. Simple as that. If someone's lying in the road, just happened. Cause it does say a collision has just happened. Try to warn other traffic as soon as possible. Make sure the injured person is kept warm. No. Place them in a recovery position. No. Warn other traffic. Yes. Safety reasons. Treat the person for shock. No. What should you do before driving into a tunnel? With this question, they can give you a quite a few options. I'm going to give you the options they can, and then we see which one they're given us. So I'll just read the question again. What should you do before driving into a tunnel? Before going into a tunnel, it will be take off your sunglasses or tinted glasses. If sunglasses is not an option, it could be tinted glasses. They use both versions. And the other one is turn your dipped headlights on before going into a dark tunnel. So let's see which one of those they gave us. Close your sunroof no switch on your windscreen wipers no switch off your radio you want to leave your radio on to be honest get any traffic information with the dab radio and take off your sunglasses so it's going to be that one but remember they can say tinted glasses if they don't give the sunglasses option what's the first thing you must do if you have a collision while you're driving your car so what's the first thing you must do stop because some people will just drive off so let's look to see what option they gave us Stop at the scene of an, yeah, stop. Actually, I will add with that, if you don't stop, it's illegal. This class is hit and run. So you need to stop at the scene of accident to make sure everybody's all right. Also with this, you must report an accident or damage you caused within 24 hours to the police. That's another type of question they can ask as well. Stop only if someone waves at you, no. Call your insurance company, no. And then call emergency services. So it's going to be that one. What information should you share if you're involved in a collision that causes damage to another vehicle? If you have an accident with someone, you want to swap details. So it's name, address and registration number. That's all you have to give. You don't have to give any other details. There's just your name, registration and address. Let's see if they gave us those options. Your occupation and the reason for your journey. Your national insurance number, no. Your name, address and vehicle registration, yes. And your internet service provider, wow. Wow, that's a really stupid question to answer there. Anyway, that's how the fury test throws it up sometimes. There you have it, another pass. That category is short and sweet, to be fair. It's pretty much straightforward out of all the categories that you have to study for. Hopefully you got some benefit from that. If you did, comment and subscribe. YouTube is going to show a video. I'm going to recommend one here. Go off and watch which one is best suited for you. And I will catch you in the next video.